and we are back, ladies and gentlemen. Now, now listen, real quick, real quick gripe and beef I got with, with everybody right now. Why didn't nobody shoot me a text message or shoot me a, some kind of message and say, yo, L, man, the weather's changing. Bruh, fam. I step outside this morning, you know, take my son to school, doing the whole good dad parent thing. You know what I mean? And, bro, when I walked out that door this morning, it was one of them, ooh, God, ooh. Uh, be right back. Go ahead and start the car, kid. Go start the car. It was one of them <laughs> type of moments. So, yeah, man, I didn't know the weather was going to just, without full warning, just flip flop on me like that, man. Now, watch. We get some cold and it's going to be hot and you're going to be like, make up your mind. Make up your mind. But anyway, man, welcome back, everybody. Appreciate y'all for coming to kick it. Today, we finna check out five cases that were solved in 2020. You know what it is. It's cold case time. You know how we get down. All right. So if you're new, hit the subscribe button. If you've never seen one of these before, prepare yourselves. You know what I mean? For an emotional roller coaster because it will piss you off and i'm mainly speaking for me i tell myself all the time but I, it still gets me all right so once you hit the subscribe button if you're new join us man as we give a little moment of silence to the haters that's enough now run them likes up baby make sure y'all hit that like button and leave a comment let's go <laughs> Born April 6, 1958, Helen Prusinski was a senior at the All Women's Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts. The 21-year-old aspiring journalist had landed an internship with the Denver, Colorado-based radio station KHOWAM and had okay. just moved in with her aunt in the nearby municipality of Inglewood in January of 1980. All seemed well for Helen's first two weeks at KHOW, and by all accounts, she was performing her duties excellently. Riding the bus to and from her workplace, she valued punctuality and was never late to work or late getting back to her aunt's house. It was for... So some people don't know what that means. You know what I mean? Some people don't know what being to work on time all the time means. How many? Keep it real. Just keep it real. I was one of those type of people, bro. Always on time. That like if I'm just getting there right at the time, I feel like I'm late. Punctuality and was never late to work or late getting back to her aunt's house. It was for this reason that Helen's aunt initially became concerned when, on January 16th, her niece still hadn't arrived back by 10.30 p.m. She quickly contacted the local police department, hoping they could find Helen. Anxiously awaiting any news, Helen's family prayed for her safe return, but the night passed with no sign of her. The following morning, a passerby alerted police to the presence of a body spotted in an empty field about 20 minutes south of Inglewood. Tragically, the worst fears of Helen's family were confirmed when police positively identified the body as that of the 21-year-old. An autopsy revealed that she had been savagely stabbed nine yeah. times in the back, Dang. causing her lungs to collapse. Her hands were tied and she was found undressed from the waist down, with additional physical evidence confirming that she had been raped by her assailant. Douglas County detectives searched for any possible leads as to the identity of Helen's vicious killer, but could find no reliable information or witness accounts. It was a daunting task for investigators, especially as they had to deal with not one, but two separate men who falsely confessed of their own volition to the murder of Helen and were eliminated as suspects after investigators found no evidence linking either to her murder. Without any other suspects or leads, the case went cold after a few years. Investigators never stopped looking, however, and revisited the case multiple times over the decades to come. Using evidence collected from the crime scene, Douglas County Police created a DNA profile for the killer in 1998, but they found no matches in either state nor federal criminal databases. In 2017, So again, another situation of where these fools get to roam free after or uh, this fool, whoever committed the crime, if it was more than one person, they get to roam free. Like, that, that, 
I don't know why that irks me. It just irks me so bad to catch them when they're 60 years old or 70 years old after they done lived their life after doing such a heinous crime. That pisses me off. I, I, I don't know why. A lot, bro. A lot. A lot. And I got to get over it, but man, it works me to death. Detectives revisited the case once again, this time employing the use of forensic or genetic genealogy to search public DNA databases for near matches with that of the DNA profile constructed from the evidence. Working with United Data Connect, a company specializing in forensic genealogy, investigators identified possible distant relatives to the suspect. After receiving permission from those possible relatives, detectives spent months searching through family trees to locate persons of interest who would have resided near the location of the crime. Using this method, investigators were able to identify 62-year-old Curtis Allen White, now known as James Curtis Clanton, as a possible match for the DNA profile. Shockingly, investigators discovered that Clanton had pleaded guilty to first-degree rape in 1975, and, despite being sentenced to 30 years in prison, Clanton was released on parole in 1979 to live with the former counselor, who offered to help Clanton, quote, get back on his feet. As a result, Clanton was behind bars for only four years and lived in Inglewood during the time of Helen. How does that happen? How? Did you not hear his sentence? Let's, let's, let's back it up. Two-year-old Curtis Allen White, now known as James Curtis Clanton, as a possible match for the DNA profile. Shockingly, investigators discovered that Clanton had pleaded guilty to first-degree rape in 1975, and, despite being sentenced to 30 years in prison, Clanton was released on... 30 years he was sentenced, and he pled guilty. Pled guilty. Admit it. You know what I'm saying? I, he's saying, I did it. And he still only did four, four of 30. You release them and look what happens. Pearl in 1979 to live with the former counselor who offered to help Clanton, quote, get back on his feet. As a result, Clanton was behind bars for only four years and lived in Inglewood during the time of Helen's rape and murder. By late November of 2019, Douglas County detectives had tracked Clanton down to the city of Lake Butler, Florida. After a few days of tailing Clanton, detectives were able to obtain a sample of his DNA from a beer mug. The sample matched exactly with that of the DNA profile created from the evidence collected at the crime scene. On December 4th, 2019, detectives arrested Clanton and charged him with first degree murder and second degree kidnapping, unable to charge him for the rape due to the statute of limitations on such crimes in Colorado. After being extradited to Douglas County, Clanton pleaded guilty to both charges on February 21st, 2020. He was sentenced to life in prison on July 1st, 2020. Under Colorado law, Clanton will be eligible for a parole hearing 20 years into his life sentence. While this case has demonstrated some disturbing oversights in the legal system, such as Clanton only serving four years of his 30 year sentence. And exactly, because if he'd have been behind bars where he should have been, this wouldn't happen possibly. 1970 can't get more simple than that five the case is yet another success for forensic genealogy and for helen's sister who told the washington post quote there's not been a day that goes by that we haven't missed her the detectives and everyone else who helped make this day happen are my heroes carolyn cox rose was somewhat of a local real estate tycoon in her hometown of pensacola florida the 47-year-old Escambia County resident was well-respected within the Florida real estate business, serving as the vice president for Better Homes Realty Incorporated. A mother, sister, and aunt, Carolyn juggled many responsibilities in both her personal and professional life. Sherry Mulholland, Carolyn's niece, described her aunt as a force within herself, never a woman to back down in the face of adversity. It was this independent and assertive attitude that propelled Carolyn to her respected status within the community, also allowing her to be a rock for her son, sister, and niece. It was also for these reasons that the events of April 7, 1978, shook Carolyn's real estate peers, her family, and the entire Escambia County community so deeply. At around 8.30 in the morning on this particular Friday, Carolyn left her office, informing her assistant that she had an appointment with a prospective buyer at a property in Cantament, a city that was about a 25-minute drive from Pensacola. Now, one thing I want to say before we get into this one, right? Um, 
I'm real familiar with like the real estate because of Queen. She did. She dabbles in it a lot. Right. And one thing they tell their agents nowadays, I don't know how it was back then, but nowadays, because this all sounds like it's leading that way, is they are, they stress to these these uh, agents, man, to be careful, because as of the past several years, man, they found some agents in a lot of these homes where people are requesting to see houses and they're, they're getting people uh, agent to take them to see a home. And they get them to show them the home. And while the agent is showing them, they end up killing the agent. You know what I'm saying? So, and a lot of these agents that are out here showing homes are doing it by themselves. These women that are out here doing it are doing it by themselves. So they're meeting up with strange people to show a house inside of an empty house. And they're killing them. People are killing them. So... That, that's what quickly went off in my head when this story started going. It may not go that direction, but that's what it made me think of. At a property in Cantament, a city that was about 25 minute drive from Pensacola. This was a ranch style property listed for $65,000, which is a little over $250,000 in today's money, adjusting for inflation. As such, the house itself was much more isolated than it would have been in a typical residential area, placed considerably back from the main road to afford privacy to its occupants. A meeting like this could go on for a few hours, depending on what a prospective buyer is looking for out of such a visit, but anything longer than that would be highly unusual. As the hours ticked by, two of Carolyn's co-workers began to grow concerned about Carolyn's extended absence, especially given the relative geographic proximity between the office and the cantonment property. When Carolyn had still not returned by 2 p.m. that afternoon, five and a half hours after she had left the office that morning, her increasingly concerned co-workers decided to visit the property and find out if there had been any issues that Carolyn had encountered. When the two co-workers arrived at 2668 Highway 297A, they immediately noticed Carolyn's 1977 Chevrolet Caprice Classic parked outside the house. Like, Dang, bro, I had that car right there. Not necessarily that year model, but I had this car, man. Bro, I love that Caprice. Anyway, back to the story. Carolyn's 1977 Chevrolet Caprice Classic parked outside the house, likely untouched since early that morning. Now sure that something was amiss, the two entered the house, hoping against hope that Carolyn was all right. Nothing could have prepared them for the grisly scene they found in the bedroom, however. Carolyn's lifeless body lay in the middle of the otherwise empty room, her arms and legs bound with ripped off pieces of her blouse that she had left the office in just that morning. Her underwear and bra had likely been used to strangle her to death, as they were still knotted tightly around her neck when she was discovered. The unexpected and brutal nature of Carolyn's rape and murder horrified those she knew in real estate, as well as the Pensacola community as a whole. Local realtors came together to offer a $5,000 reward to anyone who had information that could lead to an arrest in the case. For many within the local real estate business, it was a horrifying wake-up call to how close any of them could have been to meeting the same fate as Carolyn. While police exhausted every possible lead they could, there was very little to go on. In fact, detectives on the case were divided about the motive and level of premeditation, with some investigators believing that the fact pattern indicated that it was a spur-of-the-moment slaying, with others on the case feeling that the nature of the murder pointed towards extensive premeditation and planning. As with Helen Prashinsky's case, I think that was planned, bro. Looking at a property off of the main road, secluded back to where nobody's going. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, I think that was premeditated. You can't tell me otherwise. Detectives were able to collect DNA evidence, but most DNA technology was barely in its infancy by the late 1970s, a significant factor in why the investigation went with very few opportunities for witness accounts or other forms of evidence. Four decades later, Escambia County Sheriff's Office investigators partnered with a forensic genealogy company to research the cold case. After significant investigative footwork, detectives finally got what they were looking for, a DNA match and a name. Julius William Hill Jr. was a match for the DNA recovered at the scene, making him the primary suspect in Carolyn's death. Unfortunately, Hill died at a California prison in 2007 while serving a 30-year sentence for two bank robberies. 
While the discovery came too late to bring Hill to justice, it also came too late for Carolyn's son, who had taken the news of his mother's death extremely hard and had hoped for years that there would be some resolution. He died just a few months ago in the spring of 2020 due to complications with the current virus. He is survived by his wife and daughter, both of whom are very glad to get closure on the case. Carolyn's niece, Sherry, told the Pensacola News Journal, quote, it's a long time to hold your breath, but it's a good ending. In the early morning hours of June 10th, 1978, two people were found in the bed of a pickup truck in Phoenix, Arizona. One, an 18-year-old woman, had been severely beaten, sexually assaulted, and tied up. Despite her injuries, the woman thankfully survived the attack. The other victim was not so lucky. 23-year-old Fernando Cayeros had been beaten to death and left with the unnamed woman in the truck. Unlike some of the previously discussed cases, this crime did produce a primary suspect within the investigation's first year. Glenn Edward Williams was 21 years old in 1978, and police eventually identified him as the likely culprit after matching fingerprints at the crime scene to Williams, who lived and worked nearby. Phoenix police arrested Williams in January of 1979 and charged him. Eventually, however, prosecutors were forced to drop the charges and let William walk free before the case could even make it to trial. There was not enough evidence outside of fingerprints that could prove, beyond a reasonable doubt, that Williams was the killer. Without further evidence or suspects, the case quickly hit a dead end and detectives stored what limited physical evidence- Told y'all, man, back in the day, wild, wild west. No DNA or uh, uh, technology to really, really hone in on people. It was the wild, wild west back then. They had retrieved. While the case was never fully closed, there was not much that could be done without new leads or information. It remained this way for almost four decades. In 2019, the Phoenix Police Cold Case Homicide Squad re-examined the evidence and circumstances of the case in an effort to utilize modern forensic tools to solve cold cases. Now armed with much more advanced DNA technology, there was finally a breakthrough in the case. Through the testing of DNA found at the crime scene and preserved by investigators in 1978, detectives were able to positively identify the DNA of the presumed attacker as a match with Williams. Glenn Williams was finally arrested on April 9, 2020, and charged with first-degree murder and sexual assault. Now 62 years old, Williams continues to deny involvement in either the murder of Fernando Cayeros or the assault on the unnamed woman. His trial is set to begin August 8, 2020. Whether or not Williams is found guilty, the case will likely be closed in lieu of evidence incriminating possible other suspects. Hopefully, the arrest of Glenn Williams can bring comfort to the family and friends of Fernando Cayeros, as well as the unnamed victim who survived the attack. If Williams is found guilty, this will be a unique example of how DNA can be used to convict individuals who were primary suspects many years ago, but could not be convicted at that time. Again. 21 years old, possibly, when he committed the crime. 60-something years old when he arrested. Pisses me off royally. Because at this point in time, he's... Savannah Hoskins disappeared 35 years ago in 1985. A 34-year-old mother of five, Savannah lived in Ogden, Utah, and was employed as a sex worker. Along with her children, she lived with her husband, Joe Hoskins. As those around her recall it, the marriage was very negative, with Joe Hoskins being a violent person. Fights between the two often turned physical, and Savannah was looking for any opportunity to get her and her children safely away from Joe. Shortly before her disappearance on the 3rd of July, 1985, she had managed to scrape together some money to finance a move to Idaho with her children. Sadly, she would never get the chance to take that major life step. Savannah disappeared suddenly and without a choice. Those close to Savannah were immediately worried that her husband may have been involved. Mm -hmm. Without a body or any other evidence confirming that Savannah was dead, police were unable to charge Joe Hoskins, despite being the primary suspect and having well-documented violent tendencies. Eleven days after Savannah was reported missing, residents walking along the Weber River were disturbed to see what appeared to be two human legs floating downstream. Police arrived at the scene and removed the legs, taking note of the light purple nail polish that was still left on the toes. After examination, detectives were unable to identify who the legs could have belonged to. When first recovered, the legs had been assumed to belong to a white female, so Savannah, a person of color, was not even in consideration for identification. 
As Audu detectives continued to investigate, they realized that the legs most likely did not belong to a white female and had actually become pale both due to the dismemberment and being in the river for such an extended period of time. With this information, police began to suspect that the legs belonged to Savannah. Still, wow. without advanced forensic technology that wouldn't be available for years, detectives couldn't confirm their theory. Savannah remained labeled as a missing person for more than three decades, and, despite their best efforts, police were unable to link Joe Hoskins to her presumed death. In 1989, Joe was arrested and sentenced for drug dealing. As a result, the five children were raised by their grandparents. Joe died soon thereafter, leaving investigators with no possible leads. In August of 2019, however, an Ogden detective reviewed the case and decided to attempt a DNA test with the only available remains of the leg, a moldy toenail. The tests finally confirmed what police had suspected for over three decades, that the legs did belong to Savannah. On March 2nd, 2020, Weber County Attorney Chris Allred announced, based on previously recorded incriminating statements, witness statements, and the DNA confirmation, that if Joe Hoskins were still alive, he would be charged with murder. Allred continued, saying, quote, We are confident, based on all the evidence, that if Joe were alive today, we would be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that... What does that do for me? If, if I'm her family, what does that do if he were alive? Uh, that does nothing for me. You know what I mean? And I get it. I would be so angry and enraged that that wouldn't do it, nothing for me. And it would definitely take some time for me to get over that. Because she was getting out. She was trying to get away. And if I had to guess, he probably got wind of it. Got wind of it and was like, oh, you think you're getting out? You leaving me? And killed her. She was trying to get out, get away. Joe Hoskins murdered his wife. Savannah's son, Joe Hoskins Jr., does not believe the police conclusion, skeptical that his father was truly behind the murder. This is an unfortunate side effect of getting closure for families of those involved, as it can sometimes reopen old wounds and bring back bad memories. For the rest of Savannah's children and grandchildren, however, this was a bittersweet moment that brought some amount of closure to the pain that they had experienced. Some of her grandchildren had been the biggest proponents of re-examining Savannah's case, so this conclusion will hopefully bring them some peace of mind. And see, sometimes that's because, you know, we shield the children from a lot of things that's going on. So he might have, you can't hold it against the son for thinking his dad didn't do it. You know, he might have been shielded from it, not seeing it, didn't understand it. So in his eyes, his dad was still a superhero and no way could have committed that crime. That's the that's the kind of so you can't really get upset with him. John Anthony Muncie was a typical high school student who lived in East Columbus, Ohio. The 15-year-old enjoyed rock music, with a particular affinity for the legendary rock groups like KISS and ACDC. His younger brother described John as being incredibly full of life, an extrovert who was well-liked by his classmates and had tremendous potential. It was a Saturday night in October of 1983 when John left his family to visit a friend who lived nearby. When his family discovered that John never arrived at his friend's house, panic took hold. The next day, October 16th, a local man a few miles outside of Galena, Ohio, about a 30-minute drive from Columbus, spotted a few garbage bags near a roadway, one of which had something that looked disturbingly like a human body part. He immediately notified the Delaware County Sheriff's Department, who arrived to investigate shortly thereafter. Inside the bags, investigators found John's body, horribly mutilated, with his arms severed and his head nearly decapitated. Mm. Investigators were able to obtain a blood sample from the presumed killer and hoped that it could provide possible leads. Unfortunately, technological limitations prevented detectives from gleaning much from the results. The case went cold and was closed shortly after, with no evidence or leads found. The case was reopened in 2010, as investigators hoped that advances in DNA technology could help identify the killer in the brutal murder decades ago. While no new leads were initially discovered, the reopening put the case back on detectives' radars. In 2018, detectives in Delaware County heard about the solving of a case that had long been cold with the use of forensic genealogy. This was exactly what they had been looking for, and they quickly began to examine the case to see if they could use the same method. 
With the help of private genetic genealogy company Parabon Nanolabs, investigators set to work searching for possible DNA matches that could produce a suspect in the case. Through this technology, they found some matches and were able to narrow down their search to a set of three brothers, two of which were eliminated as suspects. The final brother and primary suspect, Alan Anderson, would have been 30 years old in 1983 and had a violent criminal history involving teenage boys, meaning that John's murder fit his M.O. DNA testing revealed that Anderson's DNA matched that of the DNA recovered from the crime scene. Unfortunately, justice came too late as Anderson died in 2013. While he is unable to be punished for his heinous actions, the breakthrough was a welcome relief for John's younger brother, who is glad to finally have all the details surrounding his brother's tragic murder clear. As police departments around the U.S. learn about these sorts of cases, we can only hope that forensic genealogy will become more widespread so that even more cold cases can be solved and justice can be brought to both the living and the dead. Yeah, that's definitely, it's definitely one thing about technology today is that they're not only using it for today's crimes and things that's happening, they're going back and giving, you know what I mean, closure to a lot of those families that have been without closure for decades, decades, bro. You know what I mean? That can stress you out. A lot of people are already dealing with day-to-day -day stress and then to have the added stress of, of a close family, immediate family member brutally murdered like yeah that's why stress is at an all-time high so shout outs to them for doing that man you know and uh y'all continue to stay safe bro lock doors lock windows secure places you know what i mean not really trusting people like that be careful start traveling with a group of people that you really really know or just don't go man Find some entertaining things to do at, ha at home. You real estate agents, take somebody with you. Um, Queen, I had to, I rode with Queen um, um, on different ones. Um, I heard other agents use like, they didn't have a, a husband or something like that. They took their parent, their dad, you know, somebody with a firearm, just some kind of way to just protect yourself out here. Because people are preying on people, man. I'm telling you. Y'all get at me in the comment section. Let me know what y'all think. And remember, stay safe. I'm out.